Yoram is the author and co-author of several books, including Tax Shift, Cartoon Introduction to Climate Change, and the Cartoon Introduction to Economics. Today, he will perform as a stand-up economist. Please join me in welcoming Yoram. Terrific. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out today. My name is Yoram Bauman. I appear before you this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, as the world's first and only stand-up economist. Thank you. It's, uh, it's a niche market. Uh, I really only have one thing going for me as a stand-up economist, and that's low expectations. You know, when I told my father that I was going to be a stand-up economist, he said, Yoram, he said, you can't be a stand-up economist. And I said, why not? And he said, because there's no demand. I said, don't worry, Dad, I'm a supply-side economist. I just stand up and let the jokes trickle down. I believe in the laugher curve. Uh, that last session about whether robots can take our jobs actually reminded me of a joke that I have. I have a whole bunch of, I have a whole bunch of you might be an economist if jokes. So you know, you might be an economist uh, if you think that America's next top model is going to be an endogenous growth model. Uh, you might be an economist if you don't read human interest stories because they don't interest you. Uh, you might be an economist if you think that supply and demand is a good answer to questions like, where do babies come from? Uh, if you plan to have your children born in December instead of January so that you can maximize the discounted present value of the child tax credit. Uh, you might be an economist if you adamantly refuse to sell your children because you think they'll be worth more later. Uh, and then I, I often, uh, occasionally in front of good audiences like this one, I tell a, a pretty hard joke, which is you might be an economist if you read your fortune cookie out loud in a Chinese restaurant and put at the margin at the end of it. And then I usually have to explain why that's such a hard joke. And the reason it's a hard joke is if you think about people in the world who know that when you go to Chinese restaurants, you're supposed to put in bed at the end of what's on your fortune cookie. You know, hard work will be richly rewarded in bed. Uh, those people are over here on the Venn diagram. This is a joke about Venn diagrams. Uh, and then if you think about people in the world who know what at the margin means, those people are sort of over here on the Venn diagram. And those two parts of the Venn diagram, like they really don't overlap very much at all. Uh, one of the times that I really struggled doing a stand-up comedy about economics, I grew up here in San Francisco. My father is retired and goes hiking every Tuesday with a group of fellow retired German immigrants. And the last time I was in town, he emailed his hiking group and said, my son is coming on our next hike and we'll be providing free comedy at lunchtime. So there I was in Mill Valley telling economics jokes to like eight elderly German women. Now that was a tough crowd. Uh, but I figured as long as I wasn't doing very well, I might as well tell this joke about the fortune cookie that rarely works. So I told the joke about the fortune cookie, and you wouldn't believe it, it didn't work. But maybe because there was something in our shared German heritage or something, this one woman insisted that I explain the joke to her so that she could understand why it was funny. Uh, and what followed was really this amazing cultural experience because I had to spend 10 minutes telling her about Chinese restaurants and fortune cookies and in bed. And then I had to spend another 10 minutes telling her about economics and at the margin. And after 20 minutes, I think she finally gets it, right until I hear her say, as she turns to walk away with her hiking companion, she says something that I think is pretty much a tagline for the 21st century. And this is what the last session reminded me of. She turned to her hiking companion and she said, I still think that joke is about computers. Well, often when I do these talks, um, uh, people tell me that I should try, you know, this is a, 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 a solid audience. I, I, I also uh, do corporate events and things like that. And the corporate events, they often, the one rule they tell me is that I should try not to offend anybody. So I often start with some jokes about politics. Uh, and I'll do you, with you the same thing I do with those groups. So many people think that, um, you know, that politics is about left wing and right wing. And so what we're going to do here is, you know, I'm going to divide you up across the political spectrum. Um, and, uh, you know, I do, I do the same routines kind of, uh, you know, the same material I do for, for trucking executives on the banks of the Arkansas River. Uh, I'm going to do it with you all here. So uh, it begins by dividing the audience up across the political spectrum. Now, I think that might be, a, I like to tell jokes that appeal to people across the political spectrum. That might be a difficult thing to do here. And, 
in the Bay Area, because in, in the Bay Area, I'm not sure how much of a political spectrum there is. Uh, but with your permission, I'm going to divide you up across the political spectrum, right? So the way people think about politics is left wing, right wing. So I'm going to divide you up right down the middle here. And for the next couple of minutes, you folks are here on my left, audience participation. You folks on my left get to represent the left wing, the American political spectrum. All right, that was okay, left wing. Now we're going to try this out. You folks here on the right, come on, I need you all to be my right wing. That was pretty good, actually. Although I have to say, when I did this in Texas last month, they started chanting USA. I want you that for me. Come on, you all on my right wing. Come on. USA, USA, USA. Yeah. Not bad, right wing. Not bad. You folks over here on the left, though, you all were perfect. No, because while the, while the right wing was chanting USA, you were just sitting there looking befuddled and vaguely unpatriotic. Uh, now, that's how most people think about politics as left wing or right wing. But if you think about economics or political science, what we call median voter theory, that actually leaves out the most important part of the American political spectrum. The left wing is actually over here, and the right wing is over here, and you all in the middle, you all are the most important part of the American political spectrum. You all are my swing voters. Now, a couple of very important things about swing voters, all right? First of all, in America, there are a lot of swing voters. All right, if you are not a communist or a fascist, all right, then you are probably a swing voter. And if you do not know the difference between communists and fascists, then you are definitely a swing voter. Uh, now, your job, swing voters, when it comes to politics and current events, extremely important swing voters. Your job is to pay absolutely no attention whatsoever. And then every four years, you determine the fate of the free world. I know it sounds like a bigger responsibility, but trust me, don't give it a second thought. And that's really how the political spectrum is divided. You've got the left wing. Their stereotype about the left wing is that the left wing is spineless. <laughs> See, they just take it. They're just like, yeah. Very good left wing. Left wing is spineless. You have the right wing. The right wing is heartless. <laughs> You're not supposed to respond to that, sir. You're just supposed to take it. The right wing is heartless. You've got spineless, heartless, and the center is clueless. Right? Clueless and apathetic. You're so clueless, you don't know what apathetic means. You're so apathetic, you can't be bothered to look it up. Uh, now, there are also, of course, the extremes of the American political spectrum, far right of the American political spectrum. Folks over here on the far right, you all on the far right get to be my libertarians. That's, that's cool. You can do what you want, libertarians. Uh, far left of the American political spectrum, folks on the far left, you all get to be my libertarians. I'm seeing confused looks from the swing voters. I know, I had someone sitting in the middle once who was like, libertarians? You mean the people that check books out for me? And I had to clarify that libertarians are freedom lovers. Right? They come in two flavors. You got right-wing libertarians. They want everybody to be free to use guns. Then you got left-wing libertarians. They want everybody to be free to use drugs. Right now, both wings of the Libertarian Party want to abolish Social Security and Medicare, right, which I think makes total sense, all right, because who's going to make it to 65 when the world is full of meth fiends with machine guns? Uh, many people are actually surprised that the Libertarians are the far right of the American political spectrum. They expect the Tea Party to be the far right of the American political spectrum, but the Tea Party is actually kind of back in deep right center field. The Tea Party is this mix of the far right and the deep center, this explosive combination of radical individualism and extreme cluelessness. No, 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 these are people who believe in social Darwinism, but don't believe in Darwin. Um, I actually was in Mississippi not too long ago, and I was talking to an audience that included some Tea Party folks, so I got a chance to talk to them, and I, I said, look, I said, I can tell that you're angry. You know, why are you so angry? And this guy jumped up, and he said, it's the gays. And, and I said, well, what's wrong with the gays? And he said, they're breeding like rabbits. <laughs> Can't win that argument. Anyway, there's a Tea Party in deep right center field. I would make similar jokes about Occupy Wall Street, which is in deep left center field. But you are not allowed to make fun of the dead. I know, I know. I'm sorry. Too soon for the Bernie Sanders crowd. It's okay. If I've offended the left wing, I apologize. Left wing, I apologize profusely. 
I will make it up to you later at the drum circle. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about politics lately because I was in China not too long ago and it had been my first time in China. And I really didn't know what to expect and I wanted to have something to say in case the Chinese people came up to me and said, you know, tell me about democracy. Uh, that didn't happen. Uh, instead, I went to China and the Chinese people came up to me and they said, tell me about your budget deficit. All right? And I had to say, let me tell you about democracy. And I know when it comes to the budget deficit, the left blames the right and the right blames the left, but I actually blame the center. I don't think we have a budget deficit because left-wing people believe in mandates or because right-wing people believe in markets. I think we have a budget deficit because people in the middle believe in magic. No, no, let me give you an example. Let me explain it. Right? Every time a left-wing politician says, hey, I've got a great idea for a road or a school or a hospital, the response from swing voters is like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Let's do that. Right? And every time a right-wing politician says we should cut taxes, the response from swing voters is like, Oh yeah, that's right, that sounds great, let's do that. And then it turns out we have a budget deficit and swing voters blame the politicians, which is kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, this is kind of like going to the doctor for your checkup and the doctor tells you you've been putting on weight and the left side of your brain is like, huh, I guess I better exercise more. And the right side of your brain is like, huh, I guess I better stop eating so many donuts. And the middle part of your brain says, huh, I guess I better get a new doctor. And then the Tea Party busts into your hospital room and they jump up on the crazy chair and they're like, I know how you can cut your weight in half. You know, and you're like, what gives you the right to interrupt my doctor's appointment? And they say the First Amendment. And you're like, how did you even get past hospital security? The Second Amendment. And all right, smarty pants, what's the Third Amendment? I don't know. But I know how you can cut your weight in half. You don't need to exercise more. You don't need to stop eating donuts. You just need to use the metric system. If you did not get that joke, that is totally not your fault, all right? That's, that is, that's my bad. No, no, let's be honest, right? First of all, let's be honest, the joke makes no sense, right? Because the Tea Party would never endorse the metric system. Secondly, in order to understand the joke, you have to know that like 300 pounds is only 150 kilos, right? Which means that the joke pretty much only makes sense to scientists, Canadians, and drug dealers. So I want you to look around and who laughed at that joke. And if they're not scientists or Canadians. Uh, before we go any further, I should show you my t-shirt. This, um, this is my Enjoy Capitalism t-shirt. Uh, made in China. If you look at the tag on the back, it was made out of 80% cotton and 20% irony. So dry, clean only. Uh, I did live in China for a little while. I want to show you the place where I lived. I lived in uh, Beijing. This is a view from my apartment window. I lived in a housing complex in Beijing that houses 400,000 people. And this is what it looked like about 5% of the time. Uh, much more often, the view from my apartment window looked like that. So some pretty serious pollution problems in China. I will be talking about those a little bit on the next panel on optimal taxation. But uh, for starters, I want to Many people are surprised that I do economics comedy for a living. It is, however, one of the few jobs. It will be, I believe it will be one of the last jobs that will be taken over by robots. Uh, many people wonder how I got into this profession, and I got into it with this next piece that I'm going to share with you. So this is, um, this is Mankiw's Principles of Economics translated. So for those of you who don't know, Greg Mankiw, Harvard professor, uh, wrote one of the best-selling economics textbooks in the country, and it's based on these 10 principles of economics. Now, I know there's a lot on the screen, but I generally encourage f folks not to try to read these. Just take my word that you pretty much need a PhD in economics to understand these 10 principles. Fortunately, I have a PhD in economics, so I've taken it upon myself to translate these principles. We're going to begin by separating them into the first seven principles, which are microeconomics, and the last three, which are macroeconomics. The difference, as P.J. O'Rourke once said, being that microeconomists are wrong about little things, and macroeconomists are wrong about things in general. Uh, so we're going to begin with the macro principles, 8, 9, and 10. Now, believe it or not, these all have the exact same translation, namely, blah, blah, blah. Okay. As proof, I need only remind you that macroeconomists have successfully predicted nine out of the last five recessions. And as further proof, we can now go up one font size. So let's go back to the micro principles. Now, the first one, people face trade-offs. This is really one of the most fundamental ideas in economics. And the translation is very simple, right? Choices are bad. I mean, anytime you have 
And you know, trade-offs are bad. Anytime you have choices, you have trade-offs. Therefore, choices have to be bad. If you don't understand that, take a look at the second principle. The cost of something is what you give up to get it. Translation, choices are really bad. Now, I have a simple little demonstration of this fact. Let's say that someone offers you a Snickers bar that you value at a dollar. All right, then what you can loosely think of as your economic profit in this situation is the dollar of the Snickers bar minus the cost you give up to get it, which is nothing. Your economic profit is a dollar. Don't all answer at once. Now, to begin to understand why choices are bad, imagine someone offers you a choice between the Snickers bar that you value at a dollar and some M&Ms that you value at 70 cents. Okay, now your economic profit, the dollar minus the 70 cents, only 30 cents you begin to understand why choices are bad. The worst possible situation, in fact, is being offered a choice between a Snickers bar and an identical Snickers bar, because then your economic profit is zero. Right now, people who are not trained in economics might say that that's no different than just being offered one Snickers bar, but that kind of sloppy thinking will never get you a tenure track position. Summarizing, choices are bad, choices are really bad. I'm not gonna beat around the bush with you folks. If you don't understand why choices are bad, you're probably stupid. Moving on, principle number three, rational people think at the margin. Translation, people are stupid. <laughs> now it's immediately obvious that people do not think at the margin. Nobody goes to the grocery store and says, I'm gonna buy an orange, I'm gonna buy another orange, I'm gonna buy another orange. Right? People don't think like that. That joke only makes sense to econ majors. But if people don't think at the margin, and if as Mankiw says, rational people do think at the margin, we are led to a most unhappy conclusion. People are not rational. People, in other words, are stupid. But before you despair for humanity, take a look at the next principle, people respond to incentives. Now the dictionary says that incentive is a noun and that it's a synonym for motive. So when Mankiw says that people respond to incentives, what he's saying is that people are motivated by motives. You may think this is a bit like saying that tautologies are tautological, right? I mean, people would have to be pretty stupid to be unmotivated by motives. But remember principle three, people are stupid. Hence the need for principle four to tell us that people aren't that stupid. All right, moving on to every economist's favorite topic, free trade. Principle five, trade can make everyone better off. Translation, trade can make everyone worse off. Now you may wonder how the translation of principle five is the opposite of the principle itself. I have a simple proof of this fact that will blow your mind. I want you to compare two statements. One of them is trade can make everyone better off. And the other one is trade will make everyone better off. Now, if you had to pick one of those two statements to put in your best-selling economics textbook, right, it's no contest. The second statement is clearly stronger. But Mankiw uses the first statement instead. And if you think about why, there's only one possible explanation. The second statement has got to be wrong. In other words, trade can make some people worse off, and from there it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to trade can make everyone worse off. Now, I figured some of you would have some questions about this, so I added a footnote with some details. Eat your heart out. Now that we've cleared that up, I want you to see the last two principles. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Translation, governments are stupid. And governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Translation, governments aren't that stupid follow immediately from principle five in its translation, right? If trade can make everyone better off, what do we need a government for? Just let people trade, right? Governments are stupid. But if trade can make everybody worse off, we better have a government around to stop people from trading. So there are the 10 principles of economics translated, and there is my website, standupeconomist.com, and that was our humorous interlude as we head up to the panel on optimal taxation. So thank you all very much. <laughs>